I think everybody sitting in the hall knows about Professor Jeremy Chapman. No Indian conference of transplantation or even nephrology complete till he is there actually. So Dr. Hariharan and Stantiran, they are the ever present, you know. So without wasting much time, I will, Dr. Jeremy Chapman is going to discuss a very important topic, that is HLA mismatch versus EPLET mismatch and acute rejection. Thank you very much, my good friend. And to everybody here, thank you for the wonderful opportunity to come back and talk with you and to meet so many old friends. Sorry about the word old, but you've been friends for a long time. Um, I was given this topic, and I want to leave you with the answer to this question. Um, but along the way, I've got a couple of other questions that I also want to address. And you may think, well, this is all known. Um, what is an eplet? How is it different to HLA typing? Is eplet matching associated with rejection? And can eplet matching be useful? And they're all slightly different turns on the same issue. Let's start with the biology. What are we looking at? We're looking at a series of antigens on the surface of the organ that we have transplanted that has the job of presenting antigen to T cells and other cells. And that biology, of course, is distorted by us doing the transplant. The initial ribbon diagram of class one um, is shown here from the side view with the cell membrane down here, and beta-2 microglobulin. And here, the receptor arms, again, as a ribbon diagram. I'll show them later as space filling. But when you put the peptide into this uh, receptor at the top, you get this picture. And when you look at it from above, you get what was described at the time, now probably 30 years ago, um, as two sausages on a barbecue. Uh, with the peptide between them. And that's what the T cell sees. And so as we have learned to understand HLA typing, we've learned to see the hypervariable regions, which are dots in red here, which cluster around the receptor groove for peptide and which alter the peptides that are held in that groove and that have protected us from multiple uh, infective uh, causes of death over our development as humans. But it's a bit more complicated than that. And so as we have learned to move from uh, basically an antibody-based typing serology through to full sequencing typing, next generation sequencing, so that we understand the genetics as well as the proteomics of these molecules, uh, we're seeing a different picture. And of course, it's a more complicated picture. And it's made especially more complicated by the tissue typers. And my apologies for the tissue typers in the audience. Um, because as tissue typers, you're, you're used to being able to bamboozle mere mortals, the rest of us clinicians. Um, into believing that it's a lot more complicated and you know a lot more about it than they do. Um, but the truth is, uh, it, there's so much that's still unknown and, and we have been deluded through this Eplot discussion. And I just want to unwrap a couple of those things. So the first thing that you have to understand is that you need the full complement of typing. You at least need uh, the two-field typing to actually understand where you're going with applets. The genetics is known, and, and we see the MHC region, and we can understand it better. Um, it's just a pity they weren't discovered in order, so then the alphabetical order and the physical order would be somewhat aligned, but they're not. 
And we have to understand from this why this region is so important to our protection. So I'm going to move now from the ribbon diagram, which was the original X-ray crystallography, to these space filling diagrams. And these shows, this shows you the uh, class one molecule HLA-B51. Uh, and it shows you the peptide in brown. And in purple are the conserved regions of the molecule that are the same between all, of, all the uh, HLA molecules, uh, B molecules. And the yellow bits, and the yellow bits are different. And so they're different across different molecules. And some of them, as you can see, affect the peptide groove, and thus they're clearly biologically important and they're in the hypervariable region. And some of them are not. They're spread around the molecule. And that's where we have run into trouble. You see here with class two, you've got the same phenomenon. With DQ, just have a look at how much yellow there is not around a peptide binding groove. So you're getting quite a lot of variability in these molecules. Hold that thought. How do we detect HLA? Well, we used to do it with serology. A person made an antibody to a molecule, and we could then see that antibody binding on another cell. Now, initially, of course, the person who made the antibody was usually a multiparous woman who had produced antibodies after pregnancy. And those were used in the 50s by Jean Dosset uh, and uh, Jean Van Rood and others to actually understand the typing for those antibody reactivities. And you see a simple reaction like this with a serological response uh, and um, a uh, clear impact of the antibody. And so our typing got more complicated and, and we got new technologies and we went to flow cross-matching because we couldn't understand it all. It was mixed up and the antibodies were mixed and we were seeing multiple antibodies and we were seeing these cross-reactive groups where different HLA molecules seemed to be grouped together and you could have an antibody to all of them. Ah, very confusing stuff. So we go to flow cross-matching where we can separate out the lymphocytes on forward and side scatter. We can then label the T and the B cells, and then we can see how much anti-human IgG is bound to um, either the T or the B cells. And we can add a serum and see if the amount of antibody has gone up. And you hear all sorts of different nomenclatures to how that's recorded, channel shift, uh, et cetera. So we've got a flow cross-match now, which is the same thing in theory. You've got the antibody that binds to the antigen, and you can detect it. There is a difference between flow cross-matching and serological cross-matching, and there's a difference between the Luminex and the traditional cross-matching. The old cross-match technology that we had, you never wash the cells and, and wash off low avidity, low affinity antibodies. With Flow and with Luminex, you wash them off. So you do get different answers from a cytotoxicity test to the Flow test. This is the thing you're all used to, Luminex, and you start with all these beads, which are all a different color. And if you can't see that they're all a different color, I do recommend you visit your optometrist and test your red-green color blindness. But fortunately, the laser does know the difference and so using simple technology and two lasers, you can split the, all of those beads out separately on a scatter. And then you can look at how much antibody is binding to them. And so you have a, a bead with an antigen adhered to it. You add antibody, you wash it off. The antibody sticks. You then add a conjugate with um, phycoerythrin. You wash that off, and now you're left with a labeled antibody that bound to your antigen. That's your Luminex test. So is it perfect? Well, no, it's getting better, and it's not as bad as this graph shows. But this shows you that if you have different antigen densities on the different beads, then you'll get different levels of positive and negative reactivity against those beads. It's not a perfect test, but it is at least based upon an antibody binding an antigen. 
not a computer. So HLA screening processes, you're now looking for the biological impact of an antibody that may bind to a donor cell, and that donor cell may not be a lymphocyte in a test tube, it may be a kidney that you've transplanted, so you really want to detect it. And so a screening to see if you've got any antibodies, if you have some antibodies, sorry, if you have no antibodies, you can wait and screen again three or six months later. If you do have some antibodies, then you need to work out what those antibodies are against. And so you use single antigen beads. So you've now got a definition of your antibodies, but be slightly careful of it because it's defined by the antigens you've got on your beads. If the antigen that the patient's got a response to is not on the beads, you're not going to see it. If it's an IgA response, not an IgG response, you're not going to see it. If it's an IgM response, you're not going to see it. Sometimes some of that's good news, some of it's bad. But just understand, this is a test. This is not miracle work. It's just a test. And you can keep a list of the people who develop antibodies against known antigens, and you can say, we're not going to transplant with those antigens. And that's useful. And it's useful in the context of deceased donor matching, and it's useful in the context of living donor matching. And you can keep screening. And let me show you the difficulty if you don't do it to the right level of specificity. So here's a recipient, B61, B44, and the donor is B44 homozygous. Perfect. No problem. So we're looking for antibodies. So we've got this serum, and this serum comes from the recipient. And there's a B44 O3 that the recipient does not have an antibody to on the single antigen beads. And there's a B4402 that's got a positive result. Not sure I can point that out for you. Is this working? There. That's positive. So now, if you hadn't done that subtyping, you'd think you'd got an antibody to the patient's own antigen. But you haven't. It's a subtype. And if you hadn't done the typing to that level, you wouldn't know. So actually, when you do the typing, the donor is not homozygous. It's B4402, B4403. And therefore, you have got a donor-specific antibody. And you do have a positive virtual crossmatch. That in this patient, there's a, the recipient has an antibody to B4402 and you're at risk of a severe acute rejection, antibody-mediated rejection. So what's the message? You have to do the typing to the level of specificity that you're testing, and you've got to have the antigen and the antibody um, specificities at the same level. There is absolutely no point doing B44 typing and then using single antigen beads that separate out uh, at a lower level. So before you start talking about eplets or anything else, you've got to get the typing level right, and it's more expensive. Now, a lot of people, including most of the United States and Australia, have gone to virtual cross matches. So you can move it all onto the computer. That's fine. We just do it all on the computer. It's much easier than messing around in a lab in the middle of the night. Okay. So UCLA has a, um, uh, a quality control system, and they look at whether the flow cross match replicates what the um, virtual computer cross match says. And you can look here at the correlation between the flow cross match and the um, predicted cross match, and you can see it's a bit of a scatter. Correlation 0.72. Ooh. And then if you look at the T cell physical cross match, in other words, the flow cross match, 
and you compare it with a virtual cross match, look at that. Out of 112 positive T cell physical cross matches, the virtual cross match missed 16. Oops. And the virtual cross match picked up 13 that weren't actually there when you did the physical cross match. Oops. That's on T cells. And there's the B cells. 15 that the um, physical cross match picked up, which were missed by the virtual cross match. So there's about an 80% concordance between the virtual cross match and the flow cross match. Beware the computer. It doesn't have all the answers because you're not putting into it everything. You're only putting into it what you're testing. And this is especially true in India. These systems are normalized, tested for, in Caucasoid, North American, North American black, and North American Asian populations. They're not normalized for the heterogeneity that you have across India. Beware. This would be worse in India. So in all of this, what is an applet? And does it actually help anybody? Well, René de Quesnoy, a very smart man, looked as we got more sequencing data and realized that he could pick up triplet um, variability between different molecules of HLA. And he could identify what he called applets, triplets originally, but then applets, which were computer identified separate different regions. They were the yellow bits I showed you on, that, on those molecules. And he could pick them up. And actually, some of those differences were seen on the same difference was seen on lots of different molecules. So it starts to explain the cost reactive antigen groups, because you've got a, an antibody that's perhaps binding to that difference. And you can then pick it up across different molecules. So it all seemed as if this was going to be really helpful. But just remember that triplet eplot is a computer program that's assigned different um, HLA molecules, some variances based on three amino acid um, differences. It's not real. It's not real. Be careful. It's not biological. It's in a computer. We don't know if the human body responds to all of those differences. So let's have a look at, if you like, what people have then transferred into the word epitope. And, and those, two trans, those two nomenclatures have been mixed up together. So the epitope, you have an antibody detected eplot, if you like. You know that somebody has produced an antibody to this difference. So on the left, those little yellow blocks are differences. And on the right is the rough footprint of an antibody that's going to bind. And so when the antibody binds to one of those airplots, it's real. It's biological. You're going to see it. It's going to happen if your organ has got that epitope sitting on it then you're going to get binding. But if it's not antibody verified, it's just in a computer. It's not biological. You can't prove it. So you have to be very careful that there's a bit of sneaky nomenclature going along in the HLA world, which talks about antibody verified eplots. Not all the programs actually pick that out. So let me show you kind of in diagram what it looks like. And yesterday, somebody had a, a rather similar diagram. So here are some recipient and donor molecules. And I've, we put in here the different shapes, which are antibody-defined reactive airplots. And you see that the different molecules, which are different HLA molecules, have different sets of eplets, but when you total it all up, you've actually got the same eplets in the recipient as in the donor. So one would predict that this was a better match. And this is where the 
technology is taking us, that maybe the HLA antigen definition isn't actually as good as it could be, and that we need to move on to something that's better, that's more antibody defined, and that can tell us where there are occasions like this, where actually the HLA would tell us no match, and where the eplets would tell us great match. Use this one. So that's the promise. Is it the reality? Wish it was. So this is, uh, again, this, a comparison of HLA molecular mismatch. So this is a computer looking at all the tissue types, picking up the molecular mismatches, and compared to amino acid uh, mismatches, uh, compared to eplet mismatches using the eplet definition. And you see that there's a bit of variation in each of them, but no reasonable correlation between what an eplet mismatch and where there are actually amino acid mismatches. But it's not antibody verified. You don't know. The, this variation could be hidden deep within the molecule and have no impact at all on an antibody response. So let's have a look at the study that I suspect stimulated the question to me to give you a talk on this subject. 926 transplant pairs. This is published in JSON, the DOIs down there. They're all genotyped at high resolution. That's a prerequisite if you're going to talk about eplets. So if you're going to think about eplets, don't think about eplets in distinction to the typing technology you're using. You've got to have high resolution typing, otherwise you're wasting your time and you're not talking about eplets. So high resolution typing. And a lot of biopsies performed. I'm very proud of them. And they looked at the eplet mismatch load for HLAA, B, C, DRB1345, DQA1B1, and DPA1B1. And we kind of know that they're biologically important, those differences. So do the eplet mismatch loads work out? So is the exact difference that you see, the total load of different eplets um, going to impact things that really matter in transplantation. So does it impact the development of de novo donor-specific antibody? A, B, C, D, R, B, D, P, A, B, mismatch eplet load does not correlate with the development of de novo DSA. OK, it doesn't correlate with DSAs. What about rejection? Same answer. Doesn't correlate with rejection. What about loss of graft function? Doesn't correlate with loss of graft function. Oh, graft failure. It must correlate with graft failure. Well, actually, B does. Now, what I've missed, of course, in that discussion is HLA-DQ-AB mismatching is figuring. And as we all know from the DSAs, it is HLA-DQ mismatching that is causing us probably most of the harmful donor-specific antibodies. So the applet load is picking that up. But otherwise, it's not. So let's have a look at how that works. And we see here the total mismatch eplet load with that top rock curve uh, outcomes at up to five years post-transplant. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd be betting my transplant on that one. 0.64. It's just better than a coin toss, but only just better. And would you make clinical decision making on that? Don't think so. If you look at the DQ, eplet mismatch load, you do see a slightly better AUC, 0.83. So if you knew the HLA-DQ mismatch load, it does impact outcomes at five years. Now, on the right, you'll see those forest plots. And I've deliberately left them small, of course, so you can't see the differences. But basically, there aren't any. They're not very important differences except what I put in the 
red box, the HLA-DQ, and the only one that's really any significant is the antibody-mediated rejection and rejection rate uh, in the DQ mismatch. Just here. Who's typing at high resolution for HLA-DQ in the room? Anybody? One, two. So if you type both your donors and your recipients for HLA-DQ, then there's a kind of logic for you to look. If you've got a choice of donors at the DQ mismatch load, if you haven't got a choice, you might look at your baseline immunosuppression and say, well, you're more at risk. But to hang your whole program on a computer system and a known incomplete set of antibody mechanisms and antigen testing mechanisms for the Indian population, I wouldn't advise it. There's a good paper you should read in an excellent journal called Transplantation um, that'll help you understand more of the confusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jeremy. It's been a very lucid and very uh, enlightening talk, uh, though, of course, uh, DQ has been finding its place in the current transplant. Uh, as I saw, just very few hands raising for uh, the Actually, uh, high-res uh, DQ, very few people are doing it, well, at least in a few centers. At least, I'm happy to see that at least a few centers are doing it. I open it for anybody to ask questions from the house. Sir, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. You know that uh, the genes of India is basically a mixture of Denisovian, Neanderthal, and yet unidentified humanoid species. This is what has been mentioned. But the Europe, I think, mainly the Neanderthal. So, you know that the HLA system has been evolved mainly to protect against the environmental infectious agents. We expect the epitopes of Europeans and the Indians, those who are exposed to different environmental stimuli, may be different. So by using the commercial kits which are available from America, are we missing any of the epitopes, HLA anti, let's say, when we do a luminex or single antigen here in India? So, so um, the short answer is yes. Um, uh, I'm not sure about the origin of the variability, but uh, India is how many thousands of villages, and each of those has family groups within it, and they're all different across India, and you know that as well as I do. Um, it does reflect the heterogeneity of HLA typing, which you can see from the uh, unrelated bone marrow registries. You have a much broader heterogeneity than we do in a Caucasoid population. I can guarantee a match for a patient in the first thousand tissue types in our Caucasoid-based registry. You couldn't do that in 10,000 in India. Um, the second comment I'd make is that the majority of the new HLA types that are defined actually come from the bone marrow registries, and the majority of those come from Indian patients, uh, donors in the registries. So the, the novelty is being discovered here. So I think you do have to be aware, and the point I was trying to make is, don't believe a computer that's not verified by a biological process, antibody verified eplets, non-antibody verified eplets are computer algorithms. And secondly, beware that you, if you're embarking on eplet typing, you've got to do um, high resolution typing of your donor and your recipient, and you've got to use single antigen beads that have those same resolutions, because otherwise you're completely wasting your time and your patient's money. All right, with that, we would like to thank the chairperson and the speakers, and to do so, can I request Dr. Pratik Das to please join us on the stage and uh, give uh, Sir a token of appreciation from our end.